Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. All right. Hey, well, good morning. I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy here, and uh, we're going to continue with our series today called Keep It Light. So we've been talking about the things that we carry around on our shoulders that are just, that weigh us down in life. And, and Jesus comes along and he says, guys, if you come to me, I can make the, the weight on your shoulders light. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. A yoke is just a piece of wood they would put over two oxen and they would pull together a heavy weight. And, uh, you know, if the oxen stayed in step with each other, they'd split the weight. But if one tried to get ahead, that one would carry a little more. If another one got behind, that one would carry a little bit more too. And, and so the, the, the challenge in, in our life is, is not carrying more than God intends for us to carry. And so we've been talking about that. And we're going to talk today about something that I think every one of us, because we live in America, have a problem with. And here is the problem. I think if you were to ask any of you, anybody, what is the standard re- response when somebody says, hey, how are things going? Usually you say, I'm good and I'm bu- busy. Yeah. I'm busy. This week, my daughter went to camp. It's the first time she's been away from home, like, ever, right? Well, not, not With not family, right? And Emily and I have been sitting around, and we're like, we have a crazy amount of time. Like, what, we don't even remember what it was like before we had this kid. And I look at myself and I'm like, boy, I wasted a lot of time before I had this kid. Because, you know, when a kid is in the house, there's just so much. They're just all consuming. And it's not just that they're always like, I'm hungry. It's, it's also like the emotional, it, they're just emotionally taxing. Like last night, I didn't have to fight with my daughter and get her to finish her food. Now, I realize some of you are like, that's not your problem. But my daughter, she can dawdle for 40 minutes, and the food is still not, like, there's still, all the food we served her is still there, and I'm like, what have you been doing for the last 40 minutes, and then the dessert comes out, and she's like, I want dessert, I'm like, well, finish your freaking lunch, dinner, <laughs> and it's not until the dessert comes out that she starts to eat, and then I have to coax her along to eat, and it's very frustrating to me, it drives me insane every night, and it's emotionally taxing. And last night, Emily and I were just sitting there quietly looking out the window eating dinner. And I was like, holy cow, it is so crazy how much like, emotional energy I have. I'm not having to fight with my kid to get her to eat. I think if all of us, if we were, you know, if, uh, I think all of us, though, we've all got stuff that just fills our life, right? If you've got three kids, think about our worship pastor, Jeremiah, he's got five that's a calling right there. <laughs> but we would all say, and, and here's the problem, was when our life gets really full like this, something comes along, and I think we all have a tendency to say something like this. How can I fit that in? Now, some of us say this with anticipation, okay? There are certain personality types, like Pastor Natalie. Yeah. She sees it as a challenge, like, ooh, how can I fit this in? One more thing, I I can make this happen by the sheer force of my power. I can fit this in, right? Some people see it as a challenge. I'm kind of this way too, so I can joke about Pastor Natalie because we're similar that way. We're both really chill people. But we see it as a challenge. How can I fit this into my schedule? I can make this fit. But then others, you look at it and something comes along and go, oh my gosh, how can this fit into our life? Like, there's just no room for this. And we say this in all of our big three resources. So we've been talking about the three resources in our life. The biggest one is time, which is what we're going to talk about today. The second biggest one is money, uh, I think. And then the third is energy, right? And we've all got these, and we've all got these. And sometimes stuff comes along, you're like, I don't, how are we going to fit this into the time schedule we have? There's just no time to fit this in. Some of you, with it's your money. And you're like, oh my gosh, another expense comes up. The washer starts squealing, and you're like, oh my gosh, how are we going to fit that in? It's just always something, right? Some of you with your energy, you just, you're just you tapped out. You're, you're sick of fighting with your kid over dinner. And it's like, how am I going to fit in more emotional energy? And then you already see the conflict over here building with your spouse, but you're just like, I don't have time or energy to deal with that. I, I know this is going to turn into a six-hour fight. 
and I need sleep. So I'm just going to ignore it, throw the cover over me, and act like I fell asleep early. Some of you are like, oh, I didn't even think of doing it that way. (laughs) Anyway. (laughs) We're all going, how are we going to fit this in? Now, so we've been talking about this idea that Jesus, he says, look, I know you're worried about all these things in life, okay? You're worried about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, all these things. Like, we're just worried about taking care of ourselves. I mean, there's just so many threats to our life. And, And some of you, if you grew up having major threats, you grew up in poverty, you're always perpetually worried about money, right? And some of you... You didn't grow up in poverty, but you're still worried about money because it's just a natural thing we do. And, and Jesus is saying, look, I get it. All of us are worried about all the same stuff. And even the pagans run after these things. And the beautiful thing is your heavenly father, he knows you need them. Amen. He knows you need them. There's nothing wrong with you for having some needs. But he says this, it, the way you get those needs met is counterintuitive. And he says it's really ethereal thing. But it's so, so true. And this is what we've been unpacking over the last few weeks. He says, if you want these needs met, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you or given to you as well. And we just talked about the, the, the kingdom of God is just God's order. It's things in right order. It's valuing what he values. And when you value what he values and put that in the right order, things go better for you. That's why I just said a second ago, happiness isn't something to aim at. Happiness is a byproduct of aiming at seeking the kingdom of God. If you're looking for happiness in life, which a lot of people are, I deserve to be happy, and yet they're, we're the more, most miserable we've probably ever been in history, because you're aimed at the wrong thing. Come on. Come on. And, and sometimes you're just not going to be happy. I was talking to a girl this morning, her father died. You try and will yourself into happiness with that, it ain't going to happen. But when you seek the kingdom of God and his order and say, God, I believe you're in control and your, your will is being accomplished in some way in the end here. That's where the peace comes, right? And you're not going to be happy, but you can have peace and you can have joy and you can have confidence in the middle of that. So, so it's just, it's how we live in harmony with the seen and unseen realities of life. But here's what tends to happen. Most of us, we forget to seek first the kingdom of God. And what we do instead is we seek whatever we think We'll take away the thing we fear the most. So I talked about this a few weeks ago. Most of us have a better idea what we don't want than what we do want. And uh, the more I share this, the more people are like, that is so true. Like, you don't necessarily know exactly what you, 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 you want, but you know what you for sure don't want. I do not want to be alone. So you just date or marry or hang out with whoever you can, even if you don't like them, just so you're not alone on a Friday night. I don't want to be poor. You say, well, what are your financial goals? To not be poor? (laughs) That's not a financial goal. That's a that's a fear, right? And and again, you can run that's running away from something rather than to something. And you can run away from something in any direction, but if you're gonna run to something, you've got to have a vision for where you're running to. As where Proverbs 29 18 it says, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. They just do whatever. And here's what we tend to do. We just keep adding stuff to our backpack of life thinking, oh, I might need this. And before you know it, you wake up one day and you're carrying around this backpack and going, I don't like this anymore. There's this, St. Augustine, he says this. He says, God is always trying to give good things to us. But our hands or our backpack are too full to, re- too full to receive them. I, when I was a kid, I remember going to uh, a, a distant aunt of mine had passed away, and I remember walking into her house, and I didn't know what a hoarder was at the time. I was only five or six, but I walked into this house, and literally, the, the hallway was this wide because there was stuff piled up all to the ceilings. All the windows were covered with magazines and cat food and like just all sorts of things. And I remember thinking, as we started just throwing stuff away, like you could actually see light start flowing in the window. And I thought, man, that's a lot picture of what of our li- a lot of our lives are like. They're so full that we have no room. We go, how can I fit this in? And unless you s- sacrifice or get rid of something, which is what we talked about in the first week, I would encourage you to go back and listen to that. Unless you sacrifice or get rid of something, there's just no room in most of our lives for anything else. I had a friend one time, and he offered me a free trip to Israel. 
Last minute canceled, but I was already too booked up. And I remember that stood out to me. I go, I, I got to stop booking myself up so much because I didn't even have the space or time to be able to go to Israel with a free trip that was offered to me, but I was so booked up that I couldn't do it. And I believe that one of the most faith-filled things we can do as Christians is create space in our lives, believing, I believe God has so much good ahead for me that I'm going to make sure that I clear out all the clutter in my life and make room for what he wants to bring to me. Because oftentimes he'll want to bring you a blessing, but you literally don't have any room to put it. And you know what? You know what it's called when like you, you just don't have any say over your time or your money or your energy? Do you know what? We have a word for that. We call it a slave. A person who is forced to work for and obey another. A device or a part of one directly controlled by another. And here's what I don't like. We're all a slave to something. It's our natural tendency. Some of us are slaves to money. Every decision you make, let's be honest, some of you men, every decision you make is based on money. The reason you're willing to move your family, rip them out of community and move them across the country to another place is because you're getting somebody dangling money in front of you like a carrot and you're a, you're a donkey or there's another word for donkey, but like... <laughs> I go, money, 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 because I don't want to be poor. And your family's over here suffering. And you're like, well, I just got a raise. Sure, who would, what kind of a fool would turn down a raise? Well, there's a lot more to life than money. Some of us are a slave to needing to feel high and energetic all the time. I talked to so many people during COVID and they came to me and they're like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm just, I, I'm like, I, I just, I don't know. I just feel like I don't have the energy I used to have. And I'm like, well, you were finally forced to slow down and the adrenaline stopped pumping in your body. And you realize you've been running on fumes for years. Like, yeah, but I don't like this feeling. Well, get, yeah, change it. You guys are brutal. But anyway, I was really compassionate. And I was like, what? Anyway. We're a slave, right? But listen to this. This is, what, this is what the Apostle Paul says in Romans. He says, but thanks be to God, though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that, was now, that has now claimed your allegiance. I would call this, you've come to obey the kingdom of God and his order. And you have been set free from sin and have now become slaves to righteousness. Righteousness is, again, when things are in right order. It's when you're in right order with God, and thank goodness for Jesus Christ because he puts you in right standing with God. That's the first step is giving your life to him, and then the second step is getting your life in line with what he says is best for you. That's a big theological word. We call it sanctification. (laughs) Sanctification is saying, God, I want to get my life in line with what you want for me because that's how I live in harmony with the seen and the unseen realities of this world, right? But we're all a slave to something. But, But here, this is really important to understand. Paul says this too. He says, for freedom Christ set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and don't submit again to a yoke. There's that word yoke again. Of slavery. Here's my first point. This is really important. Margin or freedom will not just happen. Well, if I just hold out long enough, things will get a lot lighter and easier. No, you'll die. You will die. But if you just hold out until you think things are going to improve, you have to make intentional decisions. Amen. Without intentionality, we will always, 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 always fall into slavery to something we don't like. Amen. That's a principle yeah. politically. Yeah. The default is not freedom. The default throughout history has always been tyranny and slavery. And if you're not intentional about it, slavery will overtake you. Because that's just the way of the world. And in our lives the same way. Well, let's get together when things slow down. And then everybody shows up at your funeral when things slow down. But you ain't there to enjoy it. I was at a funeral last week. And I remember it was like, man, it's cool to see all these people. It's too bad a funeral had to bring us together. But you get real intentional once they're dead. Bless you. 
We have to be intentional about it because life is naturally going to crowd us out. And I want to talk specifically, I could talk about margin in, in a lot of areas, but I want to talk specifically about margin in two areas today. Uh, the first one is in communication, okay? You go, what does margin or space or freedom have to do with communication? Here, here, here's a really important point. Good communication always requires margin. You go, what does that mean? Margin just means unhurried space and time for you to communicate. Because here's the challenge with communication. Most of us don't know really what's going on inside of us until the word becomes flesh, until it's spoken. I, my wife and I, uh, oftentimes things will be building. And we're getting, you know, like I can tell things are building when she's like, what are you doing in the kitchen? I'm like, I'm trying to make a sandwich. Can't you just leave? Like, when she's irritated with my very presence, <laughs> it's a sign that something has been building. And what we have to do is, I'll have to be like, what's your problem? Nothing's my problem. You're my problem. Anybody have these kind of conversations? They're very unproductive. But... But what ends up happening is as we talk it out for a while, if I leave room for her to talk it out, she'll go, well, you know when you did this yesterday, I really felt like you didn't care about me. And I'm like, what? And then she'll say something like this. And I didn't even realize it until just now because it took some time. And that's how most of us work. When I go on a trip, I'll go on a, you know, we went to Peru a couple weeks ago, or I went on a, a trip this week, and I'll come back, and my wife will be like, how was your trip? And I'll be like, it was good. And she'll be like, well, what happened? And I'll be like, well, this happened, this happened, this happened. And that's not what she wants to know. She wants to know interaction with people and emotional connection. All you women are nodding your heads. Anyway, uh, but I, it takes me about two weeks to unpack all that, because when I'm living life, I'm just kind of driving forward. And then afterwards, I think about, you know, that's kind of weird how somebody said this to, this to me and that. And look, we just, a lot of us, we don't realize what's going on inside of us because we talked last week about that self-awareness thing. There's this deep well within you. We don't realize it until we talk it out. And the, the greatest gift you can give to somebody is to give them time to talk out their thoughts. So and you, it's, it's easy to go, well, get to the point. I'm kind of busy. Mm -hmm. that ain't no, and it's not going to work in a marriage specifically. Okay. And so, listen, this is super important. It's been pretty much proven that just in a marriage, just to communicate, like, functional, necessary things, write this number down, 90 minutes per week is required in a marriage just to communicate details about life. That's an hour and a half. And all you guys are like, that sucks. 90 <laughs> minutes. I'm not even talking about emotional connection here. I'm just talking about the kids have to be at this. We have this event. Coming up is this. Have you paid this bill? 90 minutes is what is pretty much required just for basic communication. And listen, I am convinced that so, the reason so many marriages fell apart during COVID wasn't because COVID was so hard. I think it's because this, good communication requires margin. And up until... COVID forced us all to slow down. Most of us had just been driving forward so hard that there was not room for communication. So you just kind of kick the can down the road. Remember that Simpsons episode where Homer's doing something stupid and they're like, well, that's not going to go well. He's like, well, that's a problem for future Homer, right? <laughs> so many of us were driving so hard and when we were forced to break, to slow down, all of this stuff that had been building within us that we had never gotten to communicate about, we were forced to start talking about it. And some of us just couldn't handle it. And the marriage had already been struggling because there'd been a lot of stuff that had been kind of brushed under the rug. But there had been no communication because there was no room for it because there was no margin. And again, it was, you know, COVID was hard on certain, you know, certain aspects of it. But I think the reason so many marriages fell apart was because so many people who had been driving forward were forced to slow down and actually communicate what was going on inside and realize wow, I have been unhappy for a long time. And then the marriage blows up. Well, it came out of nowhere. No, no, no. It took you 20 years to get here. That's most marriages, right? Because when there's lack of communication, here's another thing I see in marriages. A guy will come to me and be like, dude, 
I don't know what happened. The marriage just blew up. We had the most perfect marriage. And when you start to talk to the wife, she's like, it was perfect to him because for the last 20 years, I've been backing down to everything he said to do just to keep the peace. And in his mind, everything was great. She did whatever he wanted. But she was miserable because she didn't stand up and speak up and, and, and own what was hers to say. I mean, she had the right to, to say what she wanted to say. But there was so much, and this is where emotional bullying comes in. If the person you're married to doesn't feel like they can say what they want to say, and you're not going to give them time to say it. I mean, I've literally seen husbands go like, I don't have time to deal with this right now. I have too much stress in my life. And the spouse is caring for all the kids at home all day, caring for the kids. And the husband's like, I got a lot going on at work. I'm like, I'm sorry, you don't get that luxury of saying, I don't have time to deal with your emotional stuff right now. Because your greatest value besides God needs to be your spouse. Amen. Amen. And if your spouse is blocking your goals, your values are out of line, buddy. <laughs> If your kids are blocking your goals, your values are out of line, buddy. Amen. Come on. Anyway. <laughs> Good communication requires margin. This is super important. And again, I think 90 minutes is the minimum. And that's why date nights are so important. And listen, you know who's the world's worst about date nights? I don't like them. And when I say a date night, I'm not talking about go to a movie because you don't, you can't talk in movies. And we talked about last week why I don't go to movies. But we, it's because I can't control, I don't, they don't have remote control. Anyway, a, a movie's not going to work because you can't communicate in a movie. And if you do, and I'm in a movie theater with you and you're communicating, I want to get mad, right? Don't talk in the movie theater. But anyway, you need time, like with no kids. And, and you say, well, yeah, but then we got to pay a babysitter. Hey, that's part of the value system here. You just got to do it. Find a good babysitter you trust. And maybe you need to move closer to family. So you've got babysitters there, right? Uh, some of you moved closer to family thinking that was going to be your babysitter. And they're like, it's been sorely disappointed. Anyway, <laughs> my point is you've got to give the margin and space for communication because it's not just going to happen like on demand. There's got to, people have to have time to talk it through. That's what counseling is for. It's just free and open, somebody letting somebody think, say, share what's in them, and usually they go, oh, I didn't even realize I was thinking that or feeling that. And all of a sudden, the solutions start to appear because for the first time, it's come to life. It's that word becomes flesh. When the word comes into flesh and is, is seen, there's something powerful that happens with that. Communication. And, and if there's anything that's lacking in this world right now, it's communication. Yeah. Yeah. We have a bunch of people that all want the same stuff, but they're all yelling past each other. And nobody wants to listen to each other because we don't have time. We're too busy getting crap done. Second thing. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or any sojourner who's with you to get gates. As your male servant, your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. There's that word slave again. And the Lord your God brought you out there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath. The first time I did a trip to Israel, I had this beautiful trip planned. And I sent the itinerary to the outfitter and they said, you can't do it this way. And I was like, why? And they said, because you have, a, you, you have a stay at a Jewish kibbutz, an Orthodox Jewish kibbutz on the Sabbath day, and they shut down their whole hotel for that night. I'm like, well, that's bad business. <laughs> and they said, we don't care. They shut, they're Orthodox Jewish, and they honor the Sabbath, and they shut it all down. I'm telling you what, it's the weirdest thing. I don't quite understand it, but like when you go to Israel on Sabbath, like, there's certain elevators that are called Shabbat, Sabbath elevators. They don't have any buttons. They just stop at every floor. And you do not want to get on that elevator if you're staying on the 20th floor. I'm, about, I'm just going to sin and push the one with the button, right? But, like, you just literally, so the doors open, so you don't have to touch anything or do any work. And it's, again, it's very legalistic in my opinion, but they take it very seriously. And I had, an al I had a guide, one of my guides. He wouldn't answer his phone on the Sabbath. I'm like, dude, I'm kind of dependent on you here. He's like, nope, I'll answer after sundown on the Sabbath. They take it dead serious. But I'll tell you, there's a peacefulness on Sabbath day there. 
Maybe it's something we need to look at. And Sabbath is simply this. Listen, you, slaves don't get a day of rest. They got to work seven days a week. Sabbath is a sign of freedom. The ability to take a day off is only a free man can do that. Amen. Slaves don't get that. And God's saying, look, I've set you free. You got to take a day to rest and let me keep the world running. Because you yeah, will. Yeah. But so many of us, man, we're going hard. And you know what we use Sunday for? The Sabbath day, whatever our Sabbath is. We use it to catch up on all the stuff we've been behind on all week. And that's not what Sabbath's for. You've got to figure out what day works for you. What I'm doing up here, it's work. I don't know, some of y'all don't think it is. You think you're just getting up there and talking. I put a lot of work into this, okay? <laughs> I can't do a Sabbath on Sunday. My Sabbath is Monday. And it's very hard because I've got this building project going out in Kerrville. And every Monday, that's when all the contractors call. But I've had to learn to say, nope, I can't do any work on Monday. I literally have to decompress. And if I don't do that, it, I can tell the difference in my life. And some of you, you guys just need to figure out a day to make, like, Sunday, we're going to go to church. I'm going to put something in the crock pot. I'm not going to make anything in this afternoon. I'm not going to use Sunday to catch up on folding the laundry. Maybe some things just need to be left undone on your Sabbath day. Let the laundry be left undone, right? And make it a time of family and connection. And trust that the Lord will keep the world going. It'll still be there Monday. All your problems will still be there Monday. You can pick them up Monday. But... It's so important, and, and I just see so many people that the reason they're so exhausted all the time is they never stop, and God says, you can't do that. You're not made to keep going like that's, that's what slaves do, but I've set you free. Don't make yourself a slave again. Stand on this freedom he gave you and say, nope, I'm going to take a day out every week, and I'm just going to rest. And it can be scary because you're like, man, but Monday's about to hit me in the face. Yeah, but that's a problem for a future homer. God will take care of it. Yes. You take a Sabbath. And it may not be able to be Sunday. Like for me, it can't be Sunday. And it can't be Saturday for me either because I'm prepping on Saturday. Monday's my day and it's hard. And some of you, man, you guys work weird, crazy schedules. You work 10, four 10-hour days and, and uh, you know, as, as nurses or you work all night. You're going to have to figure out what works within the kind of the rhythm of your life. But take it really, really seriously. Yeah. Because the Sabbath is absolutely imperative. So I'm going to close this verse. I love this. King David, he says this. He says, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. A few years ago, I took a bunch of really, 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 really wealthy, high, high net worth guys hiking on the Inca Trail. And uh, the guy that was coordinating the trip, he called me and he said this. He said, I want you to spare no expense on this trip. And I didn't even know what that meant. because I don't know how to not spare any expense. I was like, how do you do that? He's like, just get the nicest of everything. And I was like, really? So I started working with these guys. And after about two days with them, I realized these people think completely differently than me. And I started asking them about it. I said, dude, first of all, like, they're not worried about money. And he goes, no, here's the thing, man. You can always make more money. You know what they're not making more of? Time. And he's like, you can always get more energy too. Just get a bunch of Red Bulls. But you can all... He's like, once time's gone, it's over. And he's like, so at some point you come to realize that once your financial needs are met, the most important thing is time. And I started thinking, what? You know, I spent about 23 hours a day worried about money. And I started thinking, what would it be like if I was more worried about how my time is used than my money is used? And it changed everything. And I'm no millionaire. But I started thinking that way. I started thinking, man, what if time really is the most important thing? And I think that's where King David is saying, if you want your money and your energy and everything else, you go, well, teach us, Lord, teach us to, to really value our time. Because if you think about it, I mean, that's one of the things entrepreneurs find that I work with. I work with a lot of entrepreneurs that have a side gig, a side hustle. And they're working their day job and they're working over here. And they, they at some point come to realize that what I've got to do is free up time from this other job to give me time to, to start this new thing. And time is what they need more because really time is what your employer is paying you for. Sure, you have some knowledge and stuff. And even if you don't work an hourly job, that's what they're paying for. They want to have you as their slave. I, I didn't mean it that way. As their employee <laughs> that they can call you whenever they need you to. That's what your employer is paying you for. And you got to figure out is, is 
Like, what's my time worth? And a lot of you are undervaluing your time. So if time really is the most important thing, the question is, what are you doing with it? First of all, are you honoring the Sabbath with it? Second of all, are you giving your best time to those who deserve it most? Those who are in your inner circle who are like your primary realm of responsibility. God, your spouse, your kids, they deserve your best time. And right now, a lot of you can't fit anything else in. And maybe what you need to do is go, you know what? We love soccer, but it's taking time away from the family. Man, you know what? We love watching TV together, but all we do is keep that TV on 24-7, and it keeps us from actually having any communication. And you may get a pushback from kids when you turn that TV off. I'll never forget, I came home one day from school, and my TV was gone. I'm like, Dad, where's the TV? He's like, I got rid of it. It's like, to get a new one? He's like, nope. He's like, I got tired of that guy in our living room dominating our family time. And he was dead serious. We didn't have a TV for a few more years. You may need to get really radical and serious about it, but make sure that you're recognizing, man, you only get so much time. Right. Yep. You know, with kids, man, it's hard. They say the, the days are long, but the years are short. That's right. Some of you are looking back and going, man, I wish I had more time with those little munchkins when I could still control them. Yeah. <laughs> Teach us to number our days that we may give a heart of wisdom. And the most important thing you can do is create space in your time, your money, and your energy Say, Lord, I believe so many good things you want to give into my hands and I'm going to make sure I leave room and space for them. I'm not going to fill my life, everything, and my finances. I'm not going to spend everything I make. I'm not going to use every ounce of time, even if it means I'm bored sometimes. I'm going to trust you. You guys receive that? Yeah. All right. Let me pray for you. Lord, we thank you so much uh, that you, man, you are guiding and directing our steps, but uh, Lord, you leave a lot up to us and so I, I pray, Lord, for wisdom in our lives, Lord, about what is the best use of our time, money, and energy. And I pray for those that are just feeling overwhelmed right now. They're even looking at the, listening to this and going, there's no way I can cut anything out. I pray that you would give them wisdom on how they can aim low and take small steps right now to find freedom. We are not slaves. We are set free. And those who are in freedom are the only ones that have the liberty to have margin. So I thank you, Lord, for that freedom. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. We do not want to be enslaved again to, a, to this yoke of bondage. If you're here this morning and you have not given your life to Jesus, it's the first step in setting yourself free from the power of sin that, that Paul talked about. I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer and you mean it in your heart, God is going to transfer you out of the kingdom of slavery, out of the kingdom of darkness, and transfer you into the kingdom of light. It starts by saying this prayer. Let's say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We got some resources for you in the back to help you on your journey. You guys can stand. You are dismissed. Make some space this week. Start this afternoon. Don't wait till tomorrow. You guys are dismissed. Be blessed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.